Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing entitled Reauthorizing the Weather Act, Data and Innovation for Predictions. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. I want to welcome everyone to our first environment subcommittee hearing today of the 118th Congress. I am honored Chairman Lucas has placed his trust in me to lead the subcommittee, and I'm excited to work with my colleague on the other side of the aisle, Ranking Member Ross, to continue the productive bipartisan history this committee has enjoyed. Today's hearing will be the first in a series that touches on a very important topic, U.S. weather policy. As the committee with the sole jurisdiction over the National Weather Service and the scientific activities at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, we have the privilege of shaping the future of weather forecasts and modeling. This is a responsibility I do not take lightly. The stated mission of the National Weather Service is to provide services that protect life and property, as well as to enhance the national economy. And I can promise you, any legislation we pursue will only help them succeed in this mission. In 22 alone, there were 18 separate billion dollar weather events that took the lives of 474 people and cost a total of $165 billion in damage to infrastructure, homes, businesses, and more. In fact, a typical year in the United States sees 26,000 thunderstorms, 5,000 floods, and 1,300 tornadoes. That's more extreme weather events than any other country. So if it wasn't obvious already, weather forecasts provide much more valuable information than indicating if you need an umbrella or not. Weather information directly saves lives and protects entire communities like the ones I represent in Northern Ohio from economic devastation. The good news is that many parties involved in this work understand the value of forecasting and come together to improve the, the timely delivery and overall accuracy of weather products and services. Collectively known as the United States Weather Enterprise, each sector, public, private, and academic, plays a critical role in understanding, observing, forecasting, and warning communities of extreme weather. There is no single sector or provider who can effectively develop and deploy all the tools needed to predict and communicate weather patterns or extreme events. Today's hearing will focus primarily on one particular piece of the puzzle, the private sector and what they bring to the table for NOAA and the Weather Service. The data and innovation they offer can make immediate and impactful improvements to the status quo. For example, we'll hear about how atmospheric temperature data collected from satellites is processed and integrated into operational models. We'll also hear about high altitude water vapor data collected from sensors on commercial planes. And we'll even hear about the development of uncrewed vehicles that can go right into the eye of an active hurricane to collect the data there. It's all very exciting stuff and truly on the cutting edge of scientific innovation. But completing the transition from initial demonstration of these technologies to long-term commercial operation requires policy that encourages federal partnerships. That is what I hope to take away from today's hearing, how we in Congress can empower the weather enterprise to innovate and excel through public-private partnerships. Doing so will enable our economic growth and protect the essential pillars of our economy, like agriculture, that are dependent on knowing what the weather will be tomorrow as well as the next season. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. I look forward to each of your testimonies. Before yielding to Ranking Member Ross, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter in, into the record three items. Chairman Lucas's opening statement, Mr. Out's prepared testimony, and a letter from the Commercial Weather Alliance highlighting important industry-related topics for the reauthorization of the Weather Act. Hearing no objections, so ordered. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentlewoman from North Carolina, from an opening statement. Well, thank you so much, Chairman Miller, for holding this important hearing on improving weather and climate predictions. And thank you to our panel of witnesses for joining us this morning to share your expertise. First, I must say that my heart goes out to the families who lost their loved ones due to severe weather storms that occurred across the South over the weekend. Rolling Fork, Mississippi, experienced one of the deadliest tornado events ever, and communities were devastated across several states. Weather forecasts help inform decisions made by Americans 
every day and play an especially critical role in protecting lives and property during extreme weather events. These phenomenon are becoming increasingly common and their severity has magnified due to climate change. Last year, the U.S. experienced 18 individual weather and climate disasters, costing at least $1 billion each. This makes 2022 tied for the third highest number of billion dollar disasters in a calendar year. Ensuring that the National Weather Service has the data and tools to provide timely and accurate forecasts is integral to the safety and well-being of Americans. A key component in advancing weather forecasting and modeling is collaboration among the academic, private, and governmental sectors of the weather enterprise. Longstanding partnerships between academia and government have been successful in furthering forecasting. And we will hear from Dr. Bushalaki, is that correct? Bushalaki, um, about fundamental research carried out by academia that is vital to the scientific advancement and innovation in weather science. North Carolina's second congressional district, which I represent, is home to one of the strongest collaborative research partnerships between the National Weather Service office and an academic institution. The National Weather Service in Raleigh and North Carolina State University have worked together for decades to improve the understanding of Southeast weather phenomena and operational forecasting techniques. Good data form the backbone of weather forecasting and modeling. As we will hear from several of our panelists today, the private sector is also playing an increasingly important role in contributing to the weather enterprise, in particular by providing additional data. While there are already a wide variety of instruments collecting data around the clock to inform weather modeling, significant gaps in coverage still exist. Expanding the source of data use for the National Weather Service's watches, warnings, and advisories is crucial. And some of that data may come from the private sector. Thank you very much. Some companies have already entered into partnerships with NOAA to provide weather data, and I look forward to hearing the panelists speak about what is and isn't working well in those partnerships and recommendations for strengthening public-private partnerships to advance the nation's forecasting capabilities. Because no great challenge has a simple answer, just adding more data to models is not enough. The accuracy of weather forecasts is directly influenced by the quality, quantity, and variety of data to inform weather models. And even with a lot of high quality data available, data assimilation continues to be its own research challenge. Significant research and development of data assimilation is vital for current and future observations. Progress in weather climate modeling will be dependent on our continued strong support for the National Weather Service and government academic private sector partnerships. Under the threat of increasingly severe weather events and climate change, improving weather forecasting is, a, is paramount to protecting the American people. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and um, I also want you to know that I will support all improvements in weather forecasting and modeling through innovations in data collection and data assimilation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I'd like to recognize uh, Ranking Member Lofgren of the full committee for her opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to you for, and uh, Ranking Member Ross for holding this hearing, as well as thanks to the witnesses. You know, California has had 12 atmospheric rivers since late December. Uh, damage to homes, communities, infrastructure is widespread across California, and flooding uh, has been just devastating in my district. Uh, last week, we had another type of powerful storm dubbed a bomb cyclone. Dozens of people died and as a result of these unusually intense and frequent storms. And I got an alert on my phone just a short while ago that another bomb cyclone is heading to my district today. 
these atmospheric rivers are not new. Uh, in fact, they have a useful role in the West by bringing water to replenish reservoirs and snowpack in the winter months. But too much uh, in, sh in a short amount of time uh, has really had a devastating effect. Uh, climate change means that um, these uh, atmospheric rivers coming over and over again may be the new normal and uh, with the warming climate. Uh, you know, these atmospheric rivers have characteristics that make them particularly difficult to, to forecast. Satellites are a good tool for looking at weather forming over the oceans, but satellites generally can't see through the clouds and heavy precipitation. Uh, satellites are also more limited in their ability to penetrate the lowest layers of the Earth's atmosphere, which is where the at atmospheric rivers hang out. However, the interagency atmospheric river reco uh, reconnaissance, which includes NOAA's aircraft, has the capability to gather data from within the storm, and it's been beneficial in filling that data gap. This data has led to significant improvements in atmospheric river forecasting, but we have aging aircrafts, and NOAA is unable to cover the full atmospheric river season. We need to increase NOAA's aircraft fleet to fly these storms during the winter months. Uh, this will be critical to safety in California. For NOAA to carry out its mission to protect life and property, it must be well-funded uh, to maintain a backbone of weather and climate data from a range of data collection tools, including airplanes, weather balloons, ocean buoys, and land-based observations. The commercial data sector can help contribute to NOAA's data collection efforts uh, in a very complimentary way. And I look forward to hearing from the witnesses on your ideas specifically how commercial data can augment our atmospheric river forecasting capabilities. In addition, academia has, has, been, has to be supported in their efforts to advance fundamental understanding of the science and innovation in weather modeling. I look forward to a discussion of the role of each of these partners in the weather enterprise and what mechanisms Congress can support to increase and expand these partnerships. I understand this is a first in a series of hearings on the Weather Act reauthorization. There's a lot more that could be done across the board to improve weather forecasting. And as we enter the appropriations season here in Congress, I'll note that the importance of providing the National Weather Service with the resources it needs to improve the availability of high quality data streams for weather forecasting can't be understated. I know that uh, bipartisan support uh, for, the, uh, for NOAA and for weather forecasting exists, and I look forward to working uh, with the full committee's chairman as well as all the members of this committee to make sure that we get the information we need to prepare for these devastating events. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Lofgren. Now, let me introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is Mr. Richard Jenkins, who is the founder and CEO of Sail Drone Inc., a leading company that has developed autonomous surface vehicles for collecting data that provides intelligence for climate, mapping, and maritime security applications. Our second witness is Ms. Meredith Bell, is the Atmospheric Program Manager for Flight Aerospace Solutions, an innovative company that partners with the airline industry to use software, weather sensors, and services to provide actionable intelligence on weather. Our third witness is Dr. Antonio Tony Busalacci, is the president of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, or fondly known as UCAR. UCAR is a nonprofit consortium of more than 120 North American colleges and universities focused on research and training in Earth system science. Unfortunately, one of our witnesses, Mr. Mike Eltz, could not be here today after testing positive for COVID before traveling. We respect his decision to stay at home and wish him the best in his recovery. Mr. Elt's testimony will still be submitted for the record, and members are encouraged to submit any questions for him to the hearing record as well. Welcome to all the witnesses, and thank you for being here today. I now recognize Mr. Richard Jenkins for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you, Chair Miller, <clears throat> Ranking Member Ross, and the members of the Environment Subcommittee for providing the opportunity to testify today. <clears throat> My name is Richard Jenkins. I'm the founder and CEO of, of Celdrone, a U.S. company based in Alameda, California. 
Saildrome manufactures, owns, and operates a fleet of uncrewed ocean going surface vehicles that are purpose built for ocean monitoring and measurements. For those who haven't seen a sail drone, imagine an uncrewed sailboat remotely operated and equipped with a range of, of science grade payload sensors to collect oceanographic and meteorological data both above and below the surface of the ocean. Powered primarily via renewable wind and solar, sail drone vehicles are environmentally friendly, able to operate 24 7 for an entire year at sea without support from a crewed vehicle. Since 2014, sail drone vehicles have spent more than 25,000 days deployed at sea and sailed nearly 1 million miles, for, for context for which is more than 40 times around the planet. <clears throat> sail drone has a long history of collaboration with partnerships with the world's leading scientific, civilian government and defence organisations to collect some of the most important and hard-to-reach data about our Earth's oceans. In particular, we had, had a very strong relationship and partnership with NOAA, the National Ocean Geographic and Atmospheric Administration, which has helped both advance our capabilities and in turn provide valuable services and data back to NOAA. Today, as we broadly consider how the private sector can contrib contribute to improving weather forecasts, I think it's valuable to put into context the importance of the oceans, both overall and as a driver for global weather. <clears throat> oceans cover over 71% of our Earth's surface and represent a key domain that impacts nearly every component of the global economy, from food production to weather, pa weather patterns, to energy production, transportation of goods, and many, many more. Put simply, the Earth is a maritime planet and the United States is a maritime dependent nation. <clears throat> However, despite the dependence of our global ocean system, the Earth oceans remain largely unobserved, unexplored, and unmapped. This is due to the fact that collecting data from the ocean is extremely costly, and the ocean is a physically harsh, immensely dangerous, and a complex environment in which to operate. From a weather prediction perspective, the importance of the ocean cannot be underestimated. For example, the top 100 meters of the, of the world's oceans have 40 times the heat capacity of the entire atmosphere, and it is now widely understood that the energy exchanges that occur in the air-sea interface are a, key, are a key driver of global weather patterns such as storms, hurricanes, and the El Nino Southern Oscillation. As such, any effort focused towards improving weather, weather prediction capabilities must consider ways to observe the ocean domain in a better and more efficient way. As I mentioned, SAIL has been partnering with NOAA as a data as a service arrangement, effectively using sail drones, sail drone vehicles to both augment and supplement NOAA's traditional ocean data platforms. For example, we're currently pairing our third consecutive mission of sail drones to monitor hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico. These missions involve deploying sail drone vehicles into areas where hurricanes are known to develop and with the intention of sending the vehicles into the eye of the storms. In the last two years, sail drone vehicles sailed near or into the eye walls of two Category 4 hurricanes, Hurricane Sam in 2021, Hurricane Fiona in 2022. Battling 100-foot waves and winds over 120 miles an hour, the USV sent back live video and real-time meteorological and oceanographic observations from the eyes of the storms. This was the first, this is the world first for an uncrewed vehicle and provided new data that is enabling us to better understand and predict these very, very dangerous storms. Data that's previously impossible. This is just one of many examples that I present to demonstrate how commercial technologies, in this case, data from uncrewed surface vehicles, plays an important role in helping NOAA meet its ocean-going research and operational mission requirements, including improved weather forecasting. As this subcommittee considers reauthorization of the Weather Act 2017, I encourage you to consider prioritizing ocean data by explicitly identifying it as a type of data that NOAA could and should source in the private sector via the Commercial Weather Data Program. I appreciate the opportunity to testify here today and express my views on behalf of Saildrone. Thanks for the attention. I look forward to answering questions. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. I now recognize Ms. Meredith Bell for five minutes to present her testimony. Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Ross, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting Flight to testify today before the, before the Subcommittee on the Environment to discuss the innovative products and services provided by the commercial sector and how they partner with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. I am Meredith Bell, an atmospheric scientist and an atmospheric program manager at Flight. In my role, I work closely with NOAA and the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, to ensure the community is receiving and decoding our aircraft data properly. We pro also provide monthly reports to NOAA regarding data quantity, location, and quality. Prior to working at Flight, I worked at both Panasonic Weather Solutions and AirDead LLC, both of which provided aircraft-based observations uh, to NOAA through our tropospheric airborne meteorological data reporting system, the TAMDAR sensor. Flight provides the airline industry with innovative data solutions to enable our partners to make smart decisions based on actionable intelligence to improve operational efficiency and sustainability through our extensive hardware, software, weather sensors, and services. Specifically for weather, Flight provides aircraft meteorological data reports, or AMDAR reports, data through our automated flight information system, the AFIRS system. 
This includes temperature, wind speed, and direction, as well as two solutions that include relative humidity, the TAMDAR sensor and the flight water vapor sensing system, the WVSS2 sensor. The TAMDAR sensor provides in situ measurements of temperature, wind speed and direction, relative humidity, icing and turbulence, as well as location and time information from approximately 130 aircraft across the globe. Flight's TAMDAR system delivers in real time a critical and unique high resolution data stream to provide improved atmospheric analysis and weather observations. Due to aging systems, the number of TAMDAR soundings are decreasing, which will have detrimental impacts on NOAA's weather models. The flight WVSS-2 sensor merges the aircraft AMDAR with the relative humidity data from the sensor to provide a complete profile of the atmosphere. The sensor is fully automated with high accuracy measurements and reliability for long-term performance. It is compact in size and weight, yet highly durable and requires low power usage and low maintenance, all of which contribute to its low cost of operation. The cost of AMDAR with flight WVSS-2 is less than 10% the cost of a traditional radioson soundings, example, the NOAA's weather balloon program, over a 10-year period. Flight provides critical weather data operationally to NOAA to improve its numerical weather prediction skill through its national mesonet program, the NMP. Flight first began working with NOAA as AIRDAT and its partners in 2006 and joined the NMP program in 2017 through Synoptic Data PBC, or Synoptic, which aggregates various sources of observations and data sets to feed into the NOAA weather models. Through Synoptic, Flight provides TAMDAR and AMDAR over AFERS observations from approximately 260 aircraft across the globe. This provides over 28,000 soundings per month to the NOAA program. Given our partnerships with NOAA on multiple programs over the years, Flight is uniquely positioned to comment on the working relationship with NOAA. NOAA is a strong advocate for increasing observations, both domestically and internationally. The WMO has also been advocating for the global weather community to recognize the importance of this data and advocating for other countries to participate in a water vapor program like Flight WVSS2 and share this information with the global weather community. Aircraft data with relative humidity remains one of the most critical observation types for rapidly updating short-range weather models. Flight continues to work closely with the WMO and NOAA so we can provide the most useful data set possible to the weather community. NOAA understands its needs on an observational level and strives to provide clear guidance uh, externally to private sector stakeholders, Congress, and the public. Flight's global airline partners gives us unique ability to easily approach airlines uh, regarding expanding our network of weather sensors over both the U.S. and data sports re regions worldwide. We intend to continue to work with NOAA to expand our networks in regions they feel will bring the most value to their both their global and mesoscale weather models. One area of partnership with the federal government that could benefit from greater coordination is the mission of av aviation turbulence forecasting, specifically turbulence and relative humidity measurements. An enhanced government mission and focus on turbulence forecasting could aid NOAA's mission of protecting lives and property, especially since turbulence is so inherently interwoven with weather phenomenon. In the future, greater collaboration between NOAA and the Federal Aviation Administration and in partnership with the expertise of private industry, our turbulence forecasts could be greatly improved, and in doing so, aviation safety would be improved. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and the members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Bell. I now recognize Dr. Antonio Busolacci for five minutes to present his testimony. Good morning, Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Ross, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on the importance of data innovation and prediction within the upcoming Weather Act reauthorization. As I've testified to this subcommittee in the past, today's weather enterprise is a triad that consists of the academic and research communities, the public sector, and the private sector. It is important to the future success of the weather enterprise that each leg of the triad continues to grow and that any reduction in size of any leg will negatively impact its diverse beneficiaries. My testimony this morning is informed by my experience with and within each of the legs of this three-legged stool. For example, during my time at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, I was the source selection official for the Sea Viewing Wide Field of View sensor satellite known as CWIS, which was one of the very first data buys not only at NASA but also government-wide. 
SeaWIFS was a satellite mission that was launched by Orbital Sciences Corporation in 1997 to monitor the Earth's ocean from space. It provided unprecedented data on ocean color, temperature, and marine chlorophyll to the university research community. From my, uh, CWIS was retired in 2010 after exceeding its design lifetime. From my perspective, CWIS was a grand success as a data buy, and as a result, I'm very bullish on the role that the private sector can play with respect to data buys, with attention to what are the best practices for such, as outlined in my written testimony. Another excellent example of the positive feedback among the research community, the federal government, and the private sector is the COSMIC program, Constellation Observing System for Meteorology, Ionosphere, and Climate. COSMIC began in April 1995 when a prototype instrument designed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory went into orbit aboard the Microlab 1 satellite on a mission conceptualized and planned by our UCARS GPS MET team. The GPS MET prototype obtained nearly 10,000 atmospheric soundings, fulfilling its role as a proof of concept experiment and paved the way for the highly successful COSMIC-1 mission from 2006 to 2020 and today's COSMIC-2 launched in 2019. The COSMIC program has been a notable collaboration among Taiwan's National Space Organization, NASA, NOAA, NSF, and what is now the United States Space Force. GPS radio occultation data from COSMIC-1 had direct and marked improvement to global analyses of the atmosphere, especially above the oceans, polar regions, and other hard sample areas, leading to improved prediction of tropical cyclones, global weather, and space weather forecasting. As a result of the COSMIC-1 program, private weather data companies like Spire that would have been here today were able to use the trailblazing technology of COSMIC-1 to develop their own observational systems for radio occultation. This commercialization of radio occultation should be celebrated and it's another fine example of how the research community, the government, and the private sector can work together to drive innovation and create value together as technology development moves forward. However, it is also worth emphasizing that America's weather enterprise already has a significant amount of data at its disposal, but U.S. weather forecasting capabilities continue to lag behind our European counterparts. This discrepancy is not due to a data deficit compared to the Europeans. Rather, our European colleagues have made greater advances in what is called data assimilation and their forecast models are better able to utilize the data that are already available. Therefore, it is critical that policymakers make significant investments in data assimilation and the modeling and forecasting workforce to enable more accurate predictive forecasts in service to society with the existing observing systems we already have. Finally, I asked the subcommittee to consider, much like NASA, the initiation of a decadal survey for the entire weather enterprise that would include a strong emphasis on data innovation for prediction, including, but not limited to the themes in my testimony, including data standards and data assimilation. Given the increased prevalence of major weather disasters across the nation, a decadal process by the National Academies will allow us to prioritize what has to be done and do so in recognition of current fiscal realities. The potential upside for the nation in implementing a more intentional decadal survey process for the weather enterprise encompassing midway assessments and a subsequent follow-on survey is enormous. If we do it right, we can leverage every leg of the triad to spur successful growth of the entire weather enterprise. If we get it wrong, we risk falling further behind with our prediction capabilities at a time when the extreme weather impacts to our nation continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And I thank all the witnesses for their testimony. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Mr. Jenkins, my district, Ohio 7, has a small piece of Lake Erie coastline just west of Cleveland, but it also contains a significant portion of the Cuyahoga River which some people might be familiar with because of its catching on fire as a result of the pollution in the late 1960s. So staying on that theme, we've heard what Saladrone can do and in, in offer in terms of ocean data for weather forecasting, but what capabilities does Saladrone have for inland waterways, including lakes? Is continuous and holistic ecosystem water quality monitoring, for example, the entire Cuyahoga River drainage basin something uncrewed vehicles are primed to do? 
Absolutely. Uh, cell drone vehicles can operate <clears throat> in any water body deeper than six feet deep. So the keels are six feet, so you need that much water to navigate. Beyond that, we're okay. <clears throat> I would say that where we're not good is in fast-flowing rivers. Um, that's a much more domain of powered vessels, powered vehicles. We're a very long endurance platform that deals with lakes, open ocean, long endurance. That said, we operate frequently on the Great Lakes. Last year, we deployed um, Lake Superior, Lake Heron, Lake Erie, both on fisheries management. So uh, we had four vehicles out last year, and we do another two vehicles this year. So we operate regularly. Uh, we're hoping to uh, bring up our mapping vehicles there soon and actually do mapping of the seabed of the lakes, which is almost entirely unmapped. Yeah, which would be incredible. Thank you for that answer. The Interagency Council for Advancing Meteorological Services, ICAMS, was established by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy under the authority of the Weather Act to improve coordination of what relevant weather research and forecast innovation activities across the federal government. I worked at the White House and know coordination among federal agencies doesn't always include input from the private sector when it should. My question to all of the witnesses here today is, have you engaged with ICAMS at all since it was stood up in 2020? And whether you have not, do you have any suggestions of how we can ensure ICAMS is achieving its mission of ensuring United States global leadership in the meteorological services enterprise? Uh, so my last contact was when Kelvin Drogermeyer uh, helped start up ICAMS. Uh, since then, I've not had much contact. But get, getting to the point of your question is, you know, the United States has invested a tremendous amount of money and resources in weather prediction, weather observations across the agencies, more so than our European colleagues. And you know, the goal and the aspiration of ICAMS is to be much more effective and efficient. So the, the, the ground has been laid, now we need to take it to the next level. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you for that, and I'll yield back. I now recognize Ranking Member Ross for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, my home state of North Carolina is particularly vulnerable to extreme weather events. Hurricanes um, on our coast, but also through the area that I represent, the Research Triangle area, and a lot of flooding, both on the east and the west. And that's why accurate and prompt weather forecasting is critical to protecting lives, property, and infrastructure. As I noted in my opening statement, academic and government research partnerships like the one between the National Weather Service Raleigh office and North Carolina State University are critical to the advancement of science and innovation for weather forecasting with the goal of improving weather forecast capabilities. The Weather Act directed NOAA's office of the ocean, oceanic and atmospheric research to further collaborate and support the non-federal weather research community and academic partners, private partners and public partners, to make funds available through competitive grants, contracts, and cooperative agreements. Dr. Uh, Busalaki, have, how have investments like these enabled further opportunities between academia and the government to collaborate, and how has that benefited the nation's modeling and forecasting capabilities? Well, thank you very much for that question. I think a great example, uh, going to your initial comment, is where we are today with respect to streamflow and river forecasting. And so NOAA has to put the National a Water Center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, and the, the model they're using, the National Water Model, started at my organization at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, it started as a spin-off of our weather research forecast model for hydrology. Barron Industries, a private sector company um, in Alabama, ported that model to Romania and Israel that then became the platform for our national model. So again, perfect example of the triad, research community, private sector, and government, now protecting life and property. Great. I'd also like to stay with you for just a minute because I want to follow up on your comments about data assimilation and the importance of enhancing that to make U.S. weather predictions more accurate. Can you help us better understand how data assimilation works, um, how it affects predictions, and why we need a new generation of data scientists trained in data assimilation for weather forecasting? Again, thank you very much for the question. It, it's somewhat of an esoteric um, topic. Let me begin this way. 
we do not have observations everywhere of the planet. The models we use to predict the weather have limitations. And so let's take the example. We have an observation here and an observation here. And in our models, we have a model grid point here and a model grid point here. Data simulation blends the observations with the model to get the best possible description of the state of the atmosphere because when we make a prediction, these predictions are very sensitive to the initial conditions. So it's blending the model and the observations in space and time so that we can reduce the errors in our initial conditions to get more accurate forecasts. The Europeans are much more deliberate and much have further long-range planning horizons with respect to data assimilation. And then with respect to the workforce, the vast majority of our data simulation scientists, software engineers are well, are coming from overseas. We need to invest in our universities, community colleges, for workforce development because if we don't, we're going to continue to fall behind our colleagues and our adversaries. Well, that's terrific. Um, what should be the specific roles of NOAA versus the NSF, the Navy, and other agencies in supporting improvements in data assimilation? So we, my organization, hosts what's called the Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation. It is a multi-agency activity. NOAA, uh, NASA, the Department of Defense, but also it comes from different appropriations lines. So as a result, uh, the funding for this activity is about $8 million a year. We compare that to the GOES-R satellite, $11 billion. So data simulation is just a, it's like the flea on the tail of the dog in terms of the investment. So we, mean, we need to make a greater investment in data simulation so we can get more bang for the buck for the, what we've already invested in these observations so we can get more information extracted out of them like the Europeans do. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Uh, I'd now like to recognize Mr. Posey out of Florida for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Bell, can you elaborate on why aircraft data is such an important way to collect weather data? Thank you for that question. Yes, I mean, it is um, extremely important to have in situ weather observations. Um, there has been numerous studies that have shown that aircraft data remains a top five data source when it comes to your weather models, um, meaning that it's one of the most important and critical uh, data sources that are being assimilated into our weather models, especially when it comes, um, uh, comes to short-term rapid cycling weather models. Um, so that's just showing that you know satellite data that is extremely beneficial for the weather models, especially the global weather models, but when we're talking about short-term forecasts, we really need this real-time observations. Okay. Uh, can you explain the process for how uh, NOAA partners with the private sector to deploy weather sensors on commercial aircraft? Yes. Uh, so in the past, um, NOAA has funded the equipage of aircraft um, with these weather sensors. Um, so they, they did do a program with um, airlines in the past. However, most of those airlines um, are going through fle fleet replacement cycles. So a lot of that data will be lost over the next five to 10 years um, as those aircraft go out of service. Um, so how flight plans to do it is we will partner with an airline and we will go to NOAA and say, and we will talk to NOAA about where they feel data would be most valuable. So if they say, we really want need data over the Pacific Northwest or Alaska or other data sparse regions, that is where we will look for a partner airline. We will go to NOAA with that partner airline, um, and then we will take care of all the STCs, the installation of the sensor, and then handle the data transmission um, down, to the, down to the ground, and then back over to NOAA. Okay. Does anybody uh, besides NOAA benefit from that? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the FAA could definitely benefit from having this information, especially when we're talking about turbulence forecasts. Um, having more in situ observations would benefit the FAA. We're also looking into um, potentially doing some increasing the sensitivity of our sensor, and that would help with contrails forecasts. So the Air Force is currently looking at um, better predictions of your contrails forecast. So they need to have those in situ relative humidity observations to be able to better predict um, where they would be forming the contrails. Yeah, Can, and you mentioned the turbulence. How, how, how would that be measured, I mean? 
Is, I mean, so, so there's a, a few things that could improve our turbulence forecast. For one, having better short-term forecasts will inherently improve your turbulence forecast because turbulence are so interwoven within your uh, general forecast. The second way is that we can uh, incorporate the NCAR EDR algorithm within our sensor so that we can also report turbulence on our aircraft. So if we have more in-situ turbulence observations, that will allow you to have uh, better turbulence uh, observations and forecasts. Okay. Is there a, uh, currently a government agency tasked with the mission of turbulence forecasting? Uh, the, the Aviation Weather Center puts out turbulence forecasts right now. Okay. Uh, would our industry and private sector uh, benefit from a clear government mission on turbulence? I mean, it's pretty critical. I mean, we, we definitely believe so. Um, it, you know, if we have better forecasts, if we have uh, more of a mission to improve our turbulence forecast, to get more in situ turbulence observations, that could enhance the mission of, an, uh, of uh, saving, protecting lives and property. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, can you tell us about the water temperature? affecting the atmosphere. Apologies. Absolutely. Oceans are driving our weather and climate by the rate of absorption and rejection of heat and carbon dioxide. <clears throat> They're absorbing the majority of the heat we make, and that is delaying climate change. So if the oceans continue to absorb heat, it delays, puts out temperature changes in the atmosphere. If it stops to absorb heat, they would accelerate the, the atmospheric warming. Uh, likewise for carbon, the ocean is absorbing our carbon. Um, if the ocean continues to do that, it, it uh, mitigates climate change on our surface of the Earth, um, but it also acidifies the ocean. So the, ca the carbon dioxide turns to carbonic acid, and it means that sh uh, uh, fish can't build bones and shells can't build shells for the, for the creatures. So very significant will disrupt our entire food chain, and that needs to be measured very specifically. Sheldon is the only autonomous platform that can measure that to very, very high accuracy. We worked with NOAA for a four-year period on a crater to develop a sensor that can actually uh, measure, detect, and quantify carbon in the atmosphere and the ocean. Very good. Uh, my time is about to expire, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Posey. I now recognize Ranking Member of the Full Committee, Ms. Lofgren out of California, for five minutes. Well, uh, thank you very much. This is a very important hearing, and all of your testimony has been enlightening. One of the things I want to ask further about uh, Dr. Busolici is um, our lagging in actually utilizing effectively the data that is collected. Uh, you know, we watch the news and we see, you know, there's our prediction and the, there's a European prediction, and the European prediction usually a little bit better than ours. So I'm wondering, um, you know, why is that? Is it the limited capacity to transmit large amounts of data? Is it deficiencies in the data scientist area? I mean, I, I agree with you that we need to emphasize um, and develop the smart people from all over the country uh, to be part of our technology workforce. But I also know that the best data scientists in the world are located in the United States. And there are some private sector companies, I understand, are trying to develop using AI um, data. I don't know whether that's part of the solution. Um, so I, I'm interested in further understanding your point of view and what we might do. Thank, thank you very much. Let me preface my remarks by saying um, I continue to be amazed with what NOAA does with what they have for the forecast mission because their forecasting yeah. remit is much broader when we talk about the European centers. So let's put that there. But when we speak about, let's say, weather forecasting, um, the, the short answer is yes to all of the above. All right? It is. Um, being able to accept more volumes of the data, so the ingest pipes have to be bigger. That's one. The Europeans do a better job of extracting the information out, let's say, separating the signal from the noise. And that's a, as a result, let's say, in the case of microwave uh, data of, of precipitation and water vapor in, in the atmosphere, they do a much better job of processing that information. Uh, and, and just, I mentioned before the GOES program, $11 billion. At the present time, only 0.02%, 0.02% of the radiance data are being used in an operational context. So just 
making an order of magnitude impact, which we think is feasible over the next several years, will have a significant impact. So it's data ingest, it being more innovative, AI is part of that, and it's hiring more people and having more high performance computing. Uh, keep. There's not a sil it's not a, a right. silver bullet, it's a portfolio approach. Well, I appreciate that, and certainly we have terrific scientists <coughs> in NOAA, but that we don't give them the tools, the computing power, and perhaps we need some additional um, data scientists uh, to be part of our crew. I'm hearing you on that, and maybe um, I see our, our chairman is here, and I thank him for his great interest in uh, assisting NOAA and, and uh, you know, that may, may be part of what we do uh, because obviously I'm concerned that uh, we may have gaps in the collection of data, but if we're not giving uh, the tools to actually assimilate the data, the computing power and the like, uh, focusing on data collection alone without utilization of that data would be a mistake. A absolutely, I'll be very blunt. When, when the bits fall on the floor, we're flushing dollars down the toilet. Yep. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Lofgren. I now recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Lucas, out of Oklahoma for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Having introduced the Weather Act of 2017, I've been along for the entire roller coaster ride that has come with establishing and implementing the commercial data program. We purposely included language to have NOAA create a strategy to assess the range of commercial opportunities, including public-private partnerships for obtaining surface-based, aviation-based, and space-based weather operations. However, while NOAA has requested information on other types of data, they've only purchased radio occultation. So, can each of the witnesses briefly answer the following? Are we currently collecting data that you believe could be used in an operational weather forecast and models? And has NOAA utilized its data through the commercial data program? Floor is yours. Thanks, sir. And that's a great question. So, yes, absolutely. We collect very, very important data <clears throat> that can be used for two forms. One is assimilation, as we're talking about here, the other one is model physics. With sail drones near the surface, you collect very, very high resolution. Uh, gradients that give you insights into how the ocean works, how the heat is transferred from the atmosphere to the uh, ocean and vice versa. Um, those are things you need to understand to put back into the models to do two things. So it's a, it's a two pronged attack. One is data for the assimilation, one is data to understand and improve those model physics. Um, so, yes, absolutely, we, we could do that. Have we done that yet? We have no. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Bell. Um, yes, we have been providing NOAA with data, but it is not currently through the CDP. Um, we provide it through the um, National Mesonet Program. Um, and again, this data is extremely important for use in our weather models. Um, there's another use of what the, what the uh, and flight aircraft data, though, as well, we can use that real time in operations at the National Weather Service centers. So the meteorologists can take in um, this aircraft data and look at soundings, a vertical view of the atmosphere. That helps when you're, they're talking about very short term forecasts. So if when they're in the operational center and they're putting out um, severe thunderstorm watches, potential for tornadoes, things like that, they can use this aircraft data in real time. So it can be used in multiple ways. Dr. Rusalaki. Mr. Chair, first, first of all, let me thank you for your leadership on this topic over the years. And another success story that we really haven't focused on today, you know, started in your own backyard, the National Mesonet Program. Started in the research environment, University of Oklahoma played a major role, started to establish the standards, and actually, you know, ended up with a commercialization opportunity. There are now something like 36 different mesonets around the country in all 50 states, a grand success story talked about radio occultation. However, I will say, there is a need for a culture change within NESDIS at NOAA. We need to get away from these sort of Battlestar Galacticas that we're putting in orbit the size of a school bus, billions of dollars, and be thinking more innovative, like radio occultation, constellation flying, formation flying, being willing to accept more risk, um, and, and starting to lower the cost to the government. Reauthorizing the Weather Act is an opportunity to make sure U.S. weather policy is up to date and pursuing the research and tools best positioned to enhance our forecasts and models. Therefore, in my remaining time, I'd like to give each of the witnesses a, a, an opportunity to highlight one or two things that they think uh, are of particular need for attention or updating in the weather 
uh, Act reauthorization. And we'll start in reverse order. Dr. Busalaki. Th thank you very much. Um, another area is we need to continue to invest in what's called ensemble predictions, where we take a variety of models, perturbed physics, um, because not any single model is perfect. And what we're finding is that in order to capture the whole breadth of this nonlinear system of our atmosphere, we need to have this sort of plethora of models. So ensemble then, is, it's computational intensive, but relatively um, straightforward. The other area is you know, a reinvestment in the time scale of subseasonal to seasonal, because that's where our water resource managers need information, agriculture, et cetera. We haven't been making the advances in our predictive skill on this time scale that's so critical to decision making. I mean, I think we really need to focus on the fact that we have decreasing data. We need to look into research on where that data, um, the aircraft data, is most valuable. So we do have less data in some regions, but perhaps um, not equipping planes over areas that we still have data and equipping planes over you know, data sparse regions, that will be the most benefit. So we need to do research on our observations that we're taking into the model and to see how much value they bring. There's also other research that um, is ongoing and needs to continue um, about how you verify satellite data. The, I've talked to so several researchers that have said that using that aircraft data is critical to validating satellite data. So we need these in situ observations to make sure our satellites are also giving out good data. I think it's two areas for me. One is, um, I mentioned carbon. Carbon is an incredibly important piece of our puzzle, not just for short-term forecasting, but long-term climate forecasting. Uh, NOAA had eight objectives at COP26, and the first objective in the science category by Rick Spinrad was global operation of a surface CO2 reference network. That has not started. Um, that's a very, very important thing to get out there and, and to, to work. The second piece is also the NOAA's Autonomous Uncrewed Technology Office. They've done a fantastic job of actually fielding unmanned systems and uh, acquiring uh, commercially available data from unmanned systems making that uh, remit um, clearer and their trajectory um, clarified and, and finance would be a fantastic opportunity. Thank you for indulging me, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd now like to recognize Ms. Bonamici out of Oregon for five minutes. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the chair, ranking member. Thank you to the witnesses for your expertise. I'm excited to be serving another uh, Congress on the Environment Subcommittee. Uh, and look forward to continuing our work together, hopefully, again, on a bipartisan basis. I was ranking member of the subcommittee working with Mr. Lucas on the roller coaster uh, when we passed the original bill. And even though it was signed into law in 2017, we know uh, the work was uh, long, began long before that. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm proud of that work. Uh, and I know reauthorization is critical, and I'm grateful for this hearing today. Uh, now more than ever, uh, we need to ha make sure our constituents are informed about weather-related risks, and I'm glad that both the chair and the ranking member of the subcommittee recognize the increasing uh, intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. I'm thinking about uh, Mississippi, uh, you know, everything is Cal California, as, as ranking member Lofgren noted. It's hard to overstate the importance of the research that's needed. Uh, Dr. Busalaki, welcome back. Good to see you again. Uh, we, we know the Weather Act included provisions regarding uh, the, the commercial partnership and, and uh, we want to strike the right balance. Obviously, you talk about the three-legged stool, uh, certainly acknowledge the benefits of the, those partnerships. Um, can you summarize uh, why the role of NOAA is important, particularly in the area of data quality and open access? Thank you very much for that question. First of all, it, the government in, in the form of NOAA provides that foundational support is the gold standard. It is provides the, the quality control so that we're not in a caveat emptor situation. And so it's that backbone that NOAA provides that allows the private sector to succeed in all the different examples and the DS up here today. And so that sort of foundational role of NOAA has to continue so that the private sector can uh, continue to succeed. Thank you, and I appreciate that you brought up the data assimilation issue, and uh, just following up on Ranking Member Ross's and, and Ranking Member Lofgren's questions about that. It's my understanding, and I want some clarity here, it, it's, it's a software issue as well as a workforce issue? That, that, that is correct. Uh, we, and an investment issue. We need more data scientists so that we can extract more data out, more information out of the data we already have. 
Yeah, that's that's something we can definitely be working on. Um, also, um, Dr. Busalaki, I want to talk about a little bit about disaster preparedness. Uh, you know, I represent a district in Oregon. A good portion of it is along the coast of Oregon, where we sit uh, on the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, producing a major earthquake and tsunami is in our future. We don't know. Um, when, but uh, it's in the future overdue. Uh, so one of my first bills in Congress was to update and reauthorize the Tsunami Warning Education Research Act, which expires this year. Uh, we know early warning and improving public safety, uh, the, the program can not only save lives, but reduce property damage. So I know you've been a leader in oceanic and atmospheric interactions for your career, and clearly understand that synergistic relationship between ocean and climate. So how can the collection and analysis of ocean data contribute to the development of climate models and forecasts systems, and what are some examples of where this data has led to innovation in weather and climate science? Great. So thanks for that question. And so um, I appreciate the question because as the first oceanographer to be president of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research in 63 years, it resonates with me because the questions that society is asking of us today are no longer just atmosphere by itself, oceans by itself, or land surface. It's studying the Earth as a coupled system. So recently, we stood up a Center for Ocean Leadership because of the importance of the role of the ocean in the coupled Earth system. El Nino only results as a result of the ocean being coupled with the atmosphere, providing us seasonal forecasting. We heard about atmospheric rivers. You know, this wet right. winter on the West Coast, all that moisture is coming from the oceans. Coastal inundation, another ocean atmosphere couple problem. I talked about subseasonal seasonal. Bottom line, sustained ocean observations are critical to advancing this forecast skill, be it satellite observations, surface observations, observations from autonomous vehicles, and subsurface observations. Thank you, and I, I see Mr. Jenkins nodding his head because I know your testimony, you, you acknowledge that, that you know, ocean covers 70% of the, of the planet. Um, and just finally, Dr. Buslaki, I don't have much time, but I wonder if you could comment on the importance of the, the IPCC's sixth uh, assessment report was just released last week, and how can we learn from these recommendations? When we work on reauthorizing legislation, how should our approach be different now than it was back when we we started this back in you know, 2000, uh, or excuse me, in, in, yeah, in 2000. Well, uh, as we saw in the IPCC report, the future is now. It's not 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We're seeing these changes today, and actually quite as a scientist, climate scientist, um, earlier than many of us expected. Thank you. I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. I now recognize Mr. Collins out of Georgia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, is it Dr. Busalaki? That's a North Georgia name. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to steal your flea comment, if that's okay. <laughs> you, uh, you commented on uh, keeping up with the Europeans. And, uh, and, and I had a whole li list of questions here, but I threw them to the side because I, I kind of want to focus on that a little bit. Cause, and, and I sit on several committees, as we all do, and, and I've been seeing a reoccurring theme of with, with a lot of our agencies. It, it seems like um, that we have, the, in this case, the data, but I'm just wondering, has NOAA lost its way or has it changed its mission? I would say neither, in, in all fairness. Uh, as I said before, you know, what we ask of them for what they, they get, they fund it, they do a marvelous job. But their remit is so broad that you know, we need to be more effective as a nation. As we, as we said before, we, have, we talked about ICAMS. Weather is separated across NASA, NOAA, NSF, et cetera. We need to be more organized as a nation with respect to the resources we already have and be more effective and efficient um, in that regard. And but so you no, made the comment that bits were falling on the oh, floor and they weren't using sure. them. So that's, that's where we do need to make more investment in data simulation and data science. And, and that is, that's where the flea comes in. It's just a small fraction. So for example, another solution uh, going forward, is when a satellite system or, a or an observational system is proposed, the ground data, data processing is built into the cost of the provision of that sensor and the data. Why not include the cost of data simulation right up front 
in the cost of the sensor and, and purchasing that data stream so that when those observations are available, we don't wait one or two years to assimilate and learn how those data, the minute those observations are available, we're, we're ingesting them into our models that very day. But it doesn't years. sound like that costs anything. It's already there. It, well, but we have to invest in the data science, and we're not investing to the extent that we need to to, to make that advance uh, and get that extraction out of the data. All right. Well, you, you had two other legs to that stool, and, and I noticed in, in some of the comments it seemed like that maybe Noah was, is, are they holding up some of the private sector from making investments on their own? I will defer to my colleagues. I, I think there's, as I outlined in my testimony, there's a number of success stories where Noah is providing insight but not oversight um, into the obtaining of private sector data, and I think that's the way it should be. Well, Ms. Bell, would you like to comment on that? I mean, I, I think there's definitely a collaboration between NOAA um, and the private sector. Um, I do think that there needs to be, you know, more more funding for that collaboration um, because as much as we do need data assimilation, there are definitely data sparse regions out there that we we need to look at. And um, I have talked to NOAA meteorologists, and they do have a desire to have more data um, than they than they currently have. Um, and I've even talked to forecasters in the office in in various offices. Um, that that has expressed the needs of having uh, more real-time data. Uh, right now, radio sound la launches are twice a day, 0Z and 12Z. That misses prime time for having um, convective outbreaks in the afternoon. If we had more aircraft data, those meteorologists in the offices could be looking at soundings that would help them forecast. So um, I believe there is a setup for partnership there, um, but more work still needs to be done. Can you, can you explain that again? I, I may have missed it when you were talking about early. Uh, airlines and planes mm -hmm. with the equipment on them. Mm -hmm. Is that, I thought I heard you say, is that NOAA's equipment or is that private equipment? So uh, Flight is currently the owner of the, the sensor, the water vapor sensing system. So we will contract with NOAA and they yeah. will buy the equipment and then we'll put them on the aircraft. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, that's all I got. You'll back. Thank you, Mr. Collins. I now recognize Mr. Frost out of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this hearing, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. The Weather Act is an example of successful bipartisan legislation and has a potential to be a real weapon in the fight against uh, the climate crisis by bringing together and expanding research, data collection, and private uh, public-private partnerships to understand increasingly dangerous weather. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, your company, Sail Drone, um, which has sent autonomous sailing vessels to map some of the most remote oceans in the world, and even sailed through hurricanes, which being from Florida is very personal to me, um, has been working with NOAA since 2014. Um, in what ways has the 2017 Weather Act positively impacted uh, that partnership? Like, what differences have you seen? Um, to be honest. Brutally honest, I don't think it has at all. We've done some amazing work with scientists under creators. <clears throat> These are the frontline scientists who want the data, want the information. Um, we have about 45 peer-reviewed papers written by government scientists about our data being climate quality, how much difference it can make to climate models, to weather models. We don't have a program where it can transition into operational models, operational uh, programs. Uh, all the scientists want the money, they ask for the money. There is no money available to progress those programs from demonstrations up to uh, big programs. So we have a lot of one-year funds, which is appropriations, trying to achieve things. Um, but what we'd really love to see is something like the Weather Act actually create a vehicle whereby these technologies that are proven to be working um, and you know, TRL-9, readiness level 9, ready for operations, transition into full-time operations, supplying data um, to models for assimilation. Okay, thank you so much. I, you know, and I think that it's very important that the data and research purchased with public dollars are available to the public for awareness, research, data collection, innovation. Uh, Mr. Jenkinson, Mr. Jenkins, again, to what degree is the data collected through your NOAA partnerships available to the public, and what is the process like for making it available? So we give all our data to NOAA in real time. So two types of data, there's near real time, which is about eight second delay to get the data, which is a low resolution, it's down sampled, and then they get the high resolution data when the vehicle comes back to shore. So they get the entire data set from the vehicle, both in real time for modeling and for in high resolution for uh, physics experiments and other kind of uh, deep dives in technology. Um, at that point, it's up to NOAA when they distribute it. I believe NOAA is mandated to release all data they have, um, which they're allowed to do with our data, of course. Um, that's really a NOAA decision when it gets to public. A lot of the scientists who write papers want to hold that data back for a few years, so it's not doesn't reveal um, the, the findings of that paper. 
Um, so it varies from um, National Weather Service bio data for atmospheric soundings, pressure, temperature, wind speed, etc. That's almost instantaneous. Um, other deep, uh, deep projects, uh, ocean currents, um, bathymetry is much longer time to get that released. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Busalachi. How do we ensure that the data collected um, through NOAA's public-private partnerships stay true to NOAA's founding mission and continuing the mission of protecting lives and property? Uh, thank you for the, that question. I think we need to settle on a set of best practices for what is in a data buy, and that's my experience with the CWIFS mission. Um, again, back to the issue of government insight but not oversight. And so uh, we never want to be totally dependent on any one particular company because of the data stream and it's important to protecting life of pro property. The importance of setting up ancillary science teams to extract even more information out of the data. We need data streams that are stable, continuous, and calibrated for actually decades. Sensors always degrade, so we need to have, make sure that the, the raw data, the level zero data, are, are archived permanently so that we can reprocess them as algorithms re improve, we can improve our science. We need uh, in insight to the instrument characterization, access to the calibration, validation, verification data so that we can ensure the integrity of this data set going forward. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, it seems like there still is a real role for public research and academic research in predict predicting weather events, which again, being from the state of Florida is really important for me, both in terms of resiliency, but also in terms of being able to look at patterns and ensure that we're prepared for these storms. You know, we just had Ian last year, which was one of our worst storms that we've had and longest storms. Um, this is for anybody on the panel. I'm curious, um, I'd love to hear if there are examples of where data collected through the partnerships with NOAA, the public-private partnerships, were able to provide better predictability um, and warn us of extreme weather uh, events. I can talk to the hurricane directly. We work into our third year with hurricanes, and that is transformationally new information. This is the first time we've got data from the surface of the ocean inside a hurricane. So hurricane intensification is very poorly understood. We've got much better at tracking the direction of hurricanes and the path but the intensification has gone actually down in skill. So the, strong, the storm's getting stronger before reaching land, probably due to the warmer temperatures, but it's unknown. So putting our vehicles into those hurricanes is actually tangibly affecting the model science to help us improve rapid intensification of hurricanes. All right, well, thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Frost. And in closing, I just want to thank the witnesses for your valuable testimony and for the members for their questions here today. The record will remain open for 10 days for additional comments and written questions for members. The hearing is adjourned.